please give it up one more time for both of our features. And I would like to quickly welcome them both back to the stage for a quick Q&A. Um, so um, I'll usually start off with uh, one, a couple of questions myself. Um, so, <laughs> um, so yeah, you can have some time to think if you've got any yourself. So, um, the first question um, for whoever would like to go first is um, how do you see the... Oh, is it on? Oh, okay. oh they're both oh, on right. um, How do you see the relationship between arts and activism? Okay, uh, for me, for me, <laughs> I guess you have to tell by the kind of poetry that I produce. For me, the two are the, the inseparable. Uh, for me, when I stand on a stage to perform, I know that I am in a privileged position. Because in some places in the world, the first people when there's any kind of social unrest to be executed or eliminated are the poets, like Ken Salwia like Michael Smith, who was stoned for his words. So when I stand on the spot there performing, I have to be an activist and I have to be trying to further the cause for social justice, or else I don't know what I'm doing. That's mine. Yeah, I was going to say that they're inextricably linked as well. And um, I was thinking about this earlier on today, um, and thinking, uh, yeah, why why is it the arts are so so effective in activism as well? And I was thinking about how actually we can have all these statistics and dry facts about different things that are going on in the world, but but the arts are something that hones in on individual stories. And um, I think there was even things about um, the horrendous things with the Windrush scandal that. that um, on my Facebook feed today, and it was always honing in on the individual stories. And I think because um, artists are given a voice to appeal to more than just one person, but many people, whether it's through novels or poetry or music or whatever it is, um, you're given an opportunity to hone in on, on individual stories. And I was thinking about projects that I might have been part of, like there's one that was... Uh, you might think big sweeping gestures like the KLF, like burning a million pounds, whatever it was all those years back, um, in the anti-capitalist movement, or um, or other things um, similar. Like in Peterborough, we had um, the Green Fest, where um, in the same vein uh, there was posters put up um, that said, um, "Oh, what was the? I'm trying to think now." Uh, Kate Jennifer and uh, I'm trying to think what the phrase was, but it was about um, best things in life aren't things. But actually, it was when they were then honed in t onto the individual stories, like what are the best things in life, like simple pleasures, like skimming stones and things. It's when we get down to that nitty gritty and identifying with personal stories. That's what the privilege of the artist is to hone in, isn't it, on, on individual stories and bring those to light. And you can't empathise unless you can be given an individual story. And I think that's. So the next question is, uh, what kind of things are you thinking about currently um, to do with gender? Should I go first? Yeah. Um, so uh, my the main thing I'm thinking about at the moment is um, as I've touched on stuff I'm exploring with um, women and sports, um, and it's really strange because before. Um, really uh, exploring more of my role and doing more poetry, I had just thought, oh, I can't write about sport. No, it's something that I can't do. Isn't, there's no audience for it. But actually, we all write from our own experience, and I feel really, really passionate about I play netball, and even saying netball, actually, it feels like this really um, a, a word that people think, oh, I don't know. It's, it feels like the word netball has become like appropriated to mean this this like really girly thing that, I mean, I shouldn't even say girly like that, but um, so the more and more I've been sort of 
digging into why that is, the more it's been sort of coming to the surface actually, um, just about where money's invested in society. You know, like netball, because it was originally a women's sport and it's never been a man's sport that then women have played, like football was becoming more and more, um, lots and lots of um, media coverage and there's women's football. But netball um, doesn't get anywhere near as much input or monetary investment and how it's so out of balance and even looking into um, uh, prize money is being addressed, I suppose, in things like tennis and things. But um, yeah, it's what, where do you place this monetary value on what a, human, a, a woman's body can do? And it's so out of balance from, from like just patriarchal um, how it's how it's been handed down over the generations. Yeah. So I've got a bit of a, a bit of a thing. Netball. So I made a bit of a film showing all, all these like ways that we've been in, and I actually played with men, and I interviewed them, and they were saying like netball I find just as strenuous as football, or this and that and that, and it's for some reason it's seen as um, yeah not as strenuous, not as energetic because it's a women's sport and it's not the case at all. So I'm just like yeah holding this <laughs> flag up for netball all the time because it's something I've done for 30 years and it's like a real passion of mine. So yeah. Uh, just to say, I used to play centre. Oh, I used to be I was centre. running all the time then. Yeah, uh, well, back, back in the day, I used to be fit, <laughs> not anymore. Uh, so, what am I thinking about in terms of gender? Mm -hmm. That was the question. Okay, so uh, I'm thinking about being clever. So, um, myself and 14 other women have written uh, our own narrative of what it is to be a clever girl. I don't actually, and even now I'm still struggling with that term. So I'm talking, uh, so I'm thinking about women who are clever, um, which throughout my childhood I was clever, but I was never made to feel clever, or it was never nurtured. So, for example, an example is um, I have a brother who's 18 months older than me, and when he finished school with his CSE uh, results, which weren't that great. Uh, my uh, stepdad framed it and put it in the sacred Jamaican front room. Now, when I finished school and I had much better CSE results than him, my stepdad was like, mm, yeah, because your job is going to be to have babies and cook and clean, so all of this qualification means nothing. But actually, uh, you know, so I'm thinking a lot about what it is to be a clever girl, because I am a clever girl and I really need to own it. Uh, I went to university after having four children and completed my undergraduate degree. And then I went back to university to do an MA in children's literature. And then I went back to university to do an MA in museum studies. And then I went back to university to do a PGC in education and became a primary school teacher. And then I went back to education and currently in my second year of a PhD. And I'm trying to come to terms with being clever and how being clever makes some men feel really intimidated. Yeah. It, it really does. Yeah. But owning my cleverness. I'm owning it, and I'm accepting it, and I'm celebrating it. So yeah, I'm thinking about women who have potential, but that potential might be uh, stamped out before they even have a chance to grow. Mm -hmm. I find both of those things such interesting things, and I don't think they've actually come up before, so that's even more interesting. I wish that we could stay here and talk more about that, but I think that unless there's any burning questions, we're probably going to have to wrap things up now. So, um, I think let's end the night on a nice big growl on the count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and enjoy the rest of your night.